Welcome uh, to the third part of the book, which basically deals with the dynamics of power. You will remember that the first part of the book was about the order of power, the second part of the book was about the balance of power, so the global west, global east and global south, and this one is about the dynamics of power. For me, the dynamics of power will be based on three chapters, one chapter on competition, second chapter on conflict, and a third chapter on cooperation. So chapter seven will be the one on competition, and that's what we're dealing with today. And as is custom, I'll start and end with an anecdote and talk about the chapter in between. So here's the anecdote. November 2009, Helsinki. Vice President Xi Jinping has requested to meet me. Out of protocol. I'm only for a minister. We had met earlier in Beijing where we had good discussions on world affairs. We get along. I like him. He's gentle-mannered. I feel that he wants to learn, understand. I have always liked curious people. Our discussion ebbs and flows between global issues. We get talking about technology. I ask him about the Chinese approach to the internet. Quote, why are you so restrictive towards some of the Western applications? I ask. He smiles and te tells me, Mr. Stubb, you come from the land of Nokia. We live in a competitive world. Why should we open our markets to American or Finnish products? We might even lose. End of quote. I often go back to that meeting and wonder why I did not take his message more seriously at the time. I was probably still living in my slightly naive illusion that technology would always be used for good and that competition would drive development for all. Remember 2009, we're living in the age of Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter and Instagram. In a perfect world, uh, that might be the case, but we do not live in a perfect world. Competition is good until it spills over to conflict. So that's the starting anecdote uh, of uh, the chapter. And uh, in order to sketch out what the chapter is all about, if you allow me, uh, I will give you an introduction and actually four points uh, and uh, a conclusion. So this chapter is about competition. Uh, and you know what? I remember in office, I used to love these reports which were making comparisons between states. You remember all the World Economic Forum and the IMD and the rest of it. Uh, and, and, you know, the Nordic countries, for instance, we are very competitive. So not only in ice hockey against Sweden, but we sort of check out that, you know, in these reports, who has the best nominal wealth? Where is the quality the best? Uh, how about the environment? How about the freedom index? Justice and education. And we sort of see that, okay, the Nordics are usually ranked, you know, somewhere between the first and the tenth in the world. And there's a reason for it. I'll get back to that in a second. But there's spe specifically one competition that I really enjoy, and that is the happiest country in the world. And of course, Finland has been ranked the happiest country in the world for six years uh, running. Now, in this chapter, I look at political competition, in other words, the systems that we have, economic competition, I look at technological competition, and then geopolitical competition. And in many ways, this chapter about competition is uh, an il illustration of the different interests that we have, but the same goal. So what's the goal? The goal is to have economic growth, to improve, to develop, to have uh, stability. And my argument is that without competition, you have no innovation. Without innovation, you have no growth. Without growth, you have no welfare. And I try to bring in the mix of the political systems, in other words, democracy and autocracy, but also uh, the economic systems. Uh, and I think that there's always going to be a balance, a balance between market and state, a balance between monopoly and fragmentation, and a balance between development and dominance. And I think in 2023, we live in a very different world of competition that we lived in when the Cold War ended in 1989.
So here we go. Uh, point number one is competing political systems. And here I ask for probably some flexibility in your thinking, uh, some, uh, how would I say, uh, open minds as well. Now, political systems in my mind, whether democracies or autocracies or, or autocracies or hybrids in between, they are in constant competition about delivery, ideology, values and power. Now, I personally believe in liberal democracy and the reason is very simple. I believe it's the best form of government uh, in comparison to all the other ones. And of course, because I've grown up uh, in a liberal democracy uh, in Finland. I've studied liberal democracy and I've worked as a civil servant, uh, a politician and an academic uh, in a liberal democracy, in other words, a free society. Um, and I do think that it's by far uh, the best uh, form of governance because it gives the individual freedom, it protects the individual from state uh, and government and it also is very much focused on human rights, fundamental rights and the protection of minorities. There's always a fairly comfortable balance of checks and balances between the judiciary, uh, between the executive and between uh, the legislative. That is, of course, if liberal democracy is perfect, which it, of course, rarely is. Now, autocracy, in an autocracy, power is very absolute. There is really no checks and balances and of course you have different types of uh, 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 autocracies. So you have an absolute monarchy like South Saudi Arabia or you have a one-party state like China or you have a military dictatorship say like Myanmar. The idea there is that in an autocracy you very rarely have free speech, you very rarely have political freedom, you very rarely have civil liberties, uh, and the like. But when I say this, it would be wrong for us as people who believe in liberal democracy to argue that autocracies never work. Like a country like Saudi Arabia, you might disagree with their political system, but you could say it's a functional society. Again, it's about creating economic wealth uh, on the altar of political freedom, but nevertheless, China, same thing. The growth rates that we've seen in China over the past 30 to 40 years are remarkable and it is not a democracy uh, by uh, any stretch of uh, the imagination. And the same goes very often with countries in the global south. We in the global west are very quick to condemn countries in the global south that don't exactly abide uh, by uh, the democratic rules that we believe in. We forget that the pretext and foundation of a democracy is a society where you have at least basic development and in that sense economic rights. So I will argue that there will be a competition between political systems uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, and of course the nice thing is that you can at least in the free world compare and contrast which one works better, autocracy, democracy or a hybrid between the two. My second point is about the competition of economic models. And of course, this is uh, as long as economic analysis, same thing actually with, uh, with, with politics. Now, when I started studying in 1989, I recall that everything was about market liberalization. Uh, it was about capitalism. It was about the death of uh, socialism uh, or communism uh, as an economic model. And I also remember sitting as a civil servant in EU meetings where people were actually preaching the virtues of the four freedoms, free movement of goods, services, money and labor. And of course I continued that myself in the internal market committee of the European Parliament from 2004 to 2008. And at, at that time there was still this sentiment that, you know, free markets and globalization, that's the thing. The general affairs, uh, the, the GATT uh, trade agreement became the WTA, oh, the World Trade Organization. Three quarters of the world's countries ended up in the WTO, which of course ended up then being quite a cumbersome institution, but nevertheless the idea was to basically liberalize trade and have multilateral uh, trade agreements. Of course there were different ideas about how capitalism should be run. So China, I'm simplifying, was about state capitalism, whereas 
Russia was very much about hyper capitalism. And of course, in the global south, it was a very much a mixed bag because it depended on, you know, which continent you were on. Was it Asia and India? Was it uh, Africa or was it uh, Latin America? So there was this competition of economic models, but it was all about, uh, basically about uh, markets. And if you wanted to be competitive, you needed to be able to generate, of course, economic growth, which was uh, the foundation for uh, welfare. But the bottom line at the time, I would argue, was that you needed stability, reliable governance uh, and resilience. But today, you know, we live in a much more uh, unstable world. I'll talk about it when I get to the geopolitical competition part. But if I nudge you in a direction, please go ahead and Google some of the reports about economic competitiveness. The IMD uh, from Lausanne has really good reports. The World Economic Forum from Geneva. The IMF, the WTO and the OECD. They all talk about different measures of economic competition. And, you know, so they look at GDP, growth, productivity and fiscal stability. Or they might look at transport, communication and energy. Or they might look at education, skills and workforce. Or they might look at research, development, patents and technology. Or they might look at regulation, governance and the general business climate. And of course, the EU is a regulatory superpower. The US is an entrepreneurial superpower. China is a superpower in state capitalism and a lot of the countries in the global east have a mix of all of these but also end up being very strong and competitive uh, in, for instance, uh, raw materials. My argument here on the competing economic models is that we have to be careful. I see winds of protectionism, winds of state control uh, blowing all around the world. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you come from the global west, global east or the global south. The third point I have uh, is the competition of technological hegemony, which we of course have dealt with throughout uh, the book. And I'll, I'll come out here and say that when I started writing this book in 2020, it was actually, the idea was, and the 60 page outline that I did, was about technology and geopolitics. And the name of the book was Digital Democracy or Digital uh, Dictatorship. So the argument was that technology could be used for good and bad. And I did a lot of research on it, did a lot of writing, but of course with the Russian attack and war on Ukraine, uh, I changed tack um, a little bit. I argue that both politics and economics is actually driven uh, by technology. And you have three ways of, of dealing with it. You can either be a tech optimist, pessimist or realist. Now, if you are a tech optimist, you say that robotization, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, nanotechnology or generative AI, you can just sort of let it be and, and allow it to develop itself and regulate itself, that it's not going to be a real problem. I think that's a little bit old school and everyone understands that uh, it doesn't matter how optimistic you are about tech, you actually are going to need some uh, regulation. The second one is to be a tech pessimist and say, ah, oh, you know, we're so far away from self-driving cars and, you know, CRISPR technology is there, but we're not going to start using gene manipulation um, uh, as a force yet. So let's just leave it be and it's not going to happen. I, I wouldn't be that pessimistic. I think it's going to happen and it is already happening and I'm not only talking about chat GPT. So in my mind the third one is the most important. You have to be a tech realist. So you have to understand that technology can be used as a force for good and a force for bad. So therefore it needs regulation and not only national regulation, it needs regional and global regulation. But there's going to be a fierce competition on who has uh, the technological advantage. And here is where I come to three elements which I talk about a lot in this chapter. Uh, date, the use of data and then chips. 
uh, and raw materials. And just to give you an idea in the interest of time, for instance, on data, you have three ways to approach it. Data is obviously the new gold and the new oil. Now, one approach uh, is the Chinese approach where data is centralized and government-based and can be widely used and mined by the government for all kinds of different purposes. The second one is the American approach, and I'm simplifying, which is more based on, 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 on private companies. And we give in the consent, say, to Facebook to use our data to a certain extent. Then the third way of dealing with it is the European way, which thinks about privacy first. Uh, and, and all of these have their good sides and bad sides. Data is a super important commodity, for instance, when it comes to understanding how we can eradicate uh, disease. But at the same time, it goes to the core of who we are as human beings. And that's why we have to deal with it very carefully. So competition is the third area. Uh, competition in technology is the third area that I look at. My final and four po fourth point before I conclude is geopolitical competition. Now, in my mind, geopolitics is back for two reasons. One reason uh, is Russia's attack on Ukraine. And I'm not saying this uh, in undermining the other wars that have taken place over the past two decades, say, for instance, uh, in Iraq or the war on terrorism. But I do think that geopolitics and conventional warfare took a completely uh, different turn on the 24th of February 2022. The second reason is about big power politics rivalry between China and the United States. It's not a new Cold War, but there is a clear tension between the two. So this is why I think geopolitics is back. Now, I remember giving a lot of talks, especially after I left office in 2016, uh, about you know, EU institutions and, and Trump and Brexit and these kinds of things. But nowadays, the talks are only about geopolitics and geopolitical risks, especially uh, to uh, the business community. They do a lot of risk assessment and geopolitical analysis. Now, in the post-Cold War era, what we tried to do was to, in my mind, generalize the European experience. So we thought that, you know, Europe was looking at eternal peace, especially after World War II, um, and, and therefore, let's try to do the same thing. And I think we got it wrong. You know, we thought that mutual interdependence or trade uh, or technology would bring us so close to each other that would make war virtually impossible, and of course that we would all gravitate towards the best form of governance, which is a combination of uh, liberal uh, democracy, market economy, and globalization. Now, why is this? Well, the reason is that the instruments of power have changed, and we've talked about it in our previous series uh, on understanding the war. And here the argument is that the things that were supposed to bring us together can also be used to drive us apart. So trade was supposed to bring us together, but you can use it as sanction, an instrument of war. Currency was supposed to bring us together, but you can use it um, uh, as an instrument of power. Uh, technology was supposed to bring us together, but you can also use it to fight the war. And information, the same thing. So I think that the notion of geopolitics is much broader than what it used to be. You know, it used to be only about geography, power and politics or about tanks and the military, but now geopolitics is a competition about politics, economics, and uh, technology, and that I talk about uh, in this chapter seven. So I'll conclude by arguing that uh, political and economic systems are in constant competition, and there is a competition of comparisons, the reports I talked about earlier. You want to create welfare, you want to create stability, you want to create growth. And it's a question of what is the best political and economic system to do that. In my mind, it's liberal democracy and market economy, but not everyone uh, agrees. Technology is a key instrument in this. So if you have a competitive edge in technology, you can probably work much better on the political scene and the economic front. Geopolitics is a much broader definition than what it used to be. I also argue that we are in a world of big power competition, 
where alliances matter and we don't know where they're going to settle. Final point in the big picture of this book, I still argue, even in this chapter on competition, that we are not seeing deglobalization, but we are seeing a regionalization of globalization and eventually, I would argue, overarching alliances uh, around the world. So we get these alliances like the Quad or AUKUS or G20, which brings now in the African Union, or the BRICS, which brings in five or six new countries, including Iran and Saudi Arabia. So we're living in a super uh, interesting world. And the most important thing is that whatever we do with competition, that it doesn't spill over to conflict, which is going to be chapter eight of the book. And in order for that not to happen, we need uh, we need cooperation, which is chapter nine. So let me finish with uh, an anecdote. It's election night. I've given it everything in the bag. Toured the country from morning to night for the past three months. I feel confident that we're going to do well. It's against all odds. After all, I'm an extrovert bilingual Finn with a funny name and driving an extremely pro-European agenda on the ticket of the National Coalition Party. I see the figures on the screen. My team is ecstatic. I get elected with flying colors, second most personal votes in the country. Throughout my career, I've helped politicians of all colors. Now I have become myself, one myself. Democracy is both exciting and scary. Fast forward four years. June 2008, I've been foreign minister for two months. Finland is chairing the OSC. I'm touring the stands. A one-on-one -on -one meeting with the notorious president of Uzbekistan, Islam Karimov. He has allegedly boiled his opposition and delivered the bodies to the families of the deceased. A nasty dictator, to put it mildly. We have a two-hour meeting more of a monologue through an interpreter. I get in about five minutes on the importance of liberal democracy. Karimov tells me in no uncertain terms that the West does not need to come to Tashkent to lecture about values. I try to say that values, including human and fundamental rights, are universal. He disagrees. I come out of the meeting shaken, hoping that something, anything, will lead to the downfall of authoritarian dictatorship. The competition of political models is as relevant as ever. Thanks for listening.